Hey, it's August 7th. It's been a week since our last Verge Bubble show. You might notice that I'm not actually D to bone, which might be a surprise. Um, but we're still carrying on. Uh, hopefully, we're going to have quite a few surprises in today's show, particularly since we don't actually know what we're doing. But let's see what happens. Stay tuned for the Verge Mobile Show. Hey, I'm Vlad Savo. I'm Chris Sigler. I'm Ross Miller. Hello. Hello. Where's Ross? Hi, sorry about that. Goodness. You know, you think that a guy who uh, is sort of the <clears throat> consummate professional with 90 seconds on the verge, uh, notice that was a nice pimp for your, your program, Thank by the you way. Uh, you think that somebody who is such professional with 90 seconds on the verge would know when to come in on cue, but apparently not. See, we're cavemen uh, at 90 seconds on the verge. We don't have a mute switch that I was rocking. I tried to open my mouth and technology prevented it. This is actually a technology pro podcast so that, you know, is a good transition to us talking about something more important. Hi, I'm rambling. We are not making this under an hour. <laughs> um, <laughs> by, well, actually, this is, uh, this is 90 seconds on the Verge Mobile show. Now, we're combining both programs, so we're actually shortening it from uh, an hour and a half to 90 seconds, which is convenient for everybody. By the way, uh, for those of you who are watching live, I just want to apologize for my video quality. Uh, we were just having this discussion right before we started broadcasting. Here's what happened. I'm, I'm going to start this show. Vlad, I know that you're supposed to take it from here and start top, talking about actual mobile news, but I'm going to do a little aside here. What happened is this. <laughs> I am recording on a, a MacBook Air. It's a 2010 model Mac. No, 20, early 2011 MacBook Air. I don't know what the... Is there the, Thunderbolt? There's no Thunderbolt. Okay. So it's, it's pre-Thunderbolt. Um, I have a, a 720p Logitech webcam that I normally use to record myself when I'm doing this show. Uh, up until last week or the week before, I can't remember, we were mostly getting SD streams from my location to the New York studio. For whatever reason, Skype decided to start uh, broadcasting me in HD in the last couple weeks. Uh, it's kind of like mysterious how that process works. You can't control it from Skype. It happens automatically. <laughs> uh, when that happened, the MacBook Air uh, ground to a halt. Uh, I just now realized after playing with the settings here between the, the internal webcam and the Logitech that when I'm broadcasting in HD, the Air just completely, I mean, it can't handle it. Skype consumes 100% of the CPU. Nothing works right. I was having terrible sync issues last week. Now I'm on the internal camera which is why I look a little fuzzier. Uh, so hopefully uh, that's not going to be too big of a problem for you. Hopefully it won't be too uh, distracting. I know that you like to see me in full 720p quality, or 1080p if it was an option. Unfortunately, it's not. Uh, so we'll Your complexion has never looked better. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. You're welcome. Hopefully next week I'm going to be on an iMac with a Core i7, and this won't be an issue anymore. Anyway, yeah, black, the moral of the story is get a real computer. Ouch. Hey, you have a MacBook Air, do you not? Dude, I'm doing this on a MacBook Air. It's actually the generation before yours, and I still think it's the best computer ever, but it has its limitations, and you just highlighted one of the big ones. Um, I think, uh, also, <clears throat> sorry. just wanted to mention, on the topic of professionalism, uh, I do want to say that that was basically the beta intro uh, that I just did because it kind of sucked. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Start, but, uh, starting with the beta. You know, starting with the beta. I like it. Yeah. Um, I, I think that will earn me a bit of audience approbation. Uh, but, you know, the most professional intro producer on our team is Dieter, who's done it many a time. Uh, he's a complete veteran. Uh, Chris has done it a couple of times. And I've done it once. Like I say, that was the beta. So we will have the Gamma, Delta, et cetera versions. And eventually... We'll get to a stage where it's all smooth and awesome, and we actually talk about mobile devices as well. Intro Omega. It will happen. It will happen. <laughs> Intro One. Omega. D uh, Dieter is a stone cold killer with these opens. Um, by the way, you might be wondering why Dieter isn't here. Uh, he is on a very secret mission uh, in our great nation's heartland, uh, doing some reporting, and you'll be seeing that shortly you'll also be seeing him on this program next week i believe not to say we don't want ross miller here every week because we do 
Um, and actually, no, Ross, since you are since you are in the studio for 90 seconds on the verge anyway, maybe we'll just, you know, commandeer you every week. I don't mind. Um, and to be honest, I have backup in case I do suffer a heart attack um, right now. Uh, I'm actually going to pull <laughs> this guy into frame right here. We have Nathan. Uh, Nathan Ingram. Hello, ladies everybody. And Hello, Nathan. Uh, What's up, guys? He exists. So, I He's real. Exist. Yes. Nathan not only exists, but he is um, a, quite frankly, there would be no news on The Verge if it were not for, for Nathan uh, and TC and Brian, who are our dear news managers and make the site tick. So a, a round of applause for Nathan, everybody out there watching right now. We can't hear you, but you know, wherever you're sitting, if you're in a public library watching this program on a computer, just start clapping. Make some noise. In fact, it'd be great if yeah. you're clapping, you're screaming, Whoa! Yeah, yes, and then you know, library is quiet. <laughs> please do. Please okay, do. Hey, Vlad, I, I'm sorry for derailing this program, Vlad. Kick please continue. <laughs> I think we filled a five minute quota of non mogul talk to make sure that anybody who's late to the show has joined in, and now everybody's here. We can start talking about uh, phones finally. Um, I think the biggest, at least from my perspective, uh, piece of news slash rumor from the past week is this five inch smartphone from HTC. And what we're dealing with here is, okay, first of all, the primary source is Digitimes, which, you know, everybody's like, well, Digitimes is like 50, 50, uh, if you're lucky. Um, but there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that goes with it. Um, but the, the rumor is that HTC is preparing a five inch Android smartphone uh, with a full 1080p display, uh, which kind of ties in with Chris's proposition that he really needs a 1080p webcam uh, so people can see him on their future HTC phones. Um, 4K. So, yeah, and, and that phone is expected uh, 4K in September or October, um, which makes sense because that's about the time that HTC likes to refresh... Uh, HTC likes to do two major refreshes of its Android flagship. One is around MWC time, already been done, and the other is around autumn time, September or October. Uh, it didn't do much with that last year. We had the Sensation XL and some pretty quite... I mean, that was it, really, oh, here in Europe. And then you had the, uh, the Resound over in the US later in the year. Uh, but this looks like a pretty major upgrade on the One X, you know, 5-inch 1080p phone, uh, also, there's a geo benchmark result, which indicates the same resolution. We've seen um, on that resolution listing, it also uh, shows it's not exactly 1920x1080. So uh, 126 vertical lines are taken up by what's presumed to be the Android on-screen buttons. It all kind of just meshes together and flows together. So it does seem like this thing is legitimate, like it's real. And the other thing is that Back in May, LG announced that it has built an IPS display with 1080p resolution at five inches. So all of the things are yep. there. All of the pieces are there for this phone to exist. Yep. Yeah, it sounds like a great so, super phablet phone lit thing. Super uh, phablet. I super like, phablet. I, like I mean, it's term. five inches. Um, so I mean, my question is, why are they doing refresh so fast? Like you said, last year, Sensation XL was not a big update. It was more iterative than it was... Uh, substantial. This seems more substantial. Did something happen with the One Series that just did not mesh as well as we hoped? My theory I, I, is that um, I, they want to create as large of a gap between them and Samsung as they possibly can, because there's a lot of, you know, obviously all the all the attention right now is the battle between Samsung and Apple, but in the Android space, there is this this uh, this less public battle going on between Samsung and HTC for premier uh, Android OEM. And, uh, you know, it, HTC just got a very, very brief uh, jump on Samsung with the One X versus the GS3. I think that they might be looking to create a slightly larger gap with their next uh, device uh, versus Samsung's next device. And, of course, there will be some sort of battle between the Note 2, which is going to be almost certainly um, announced it at IFA and whatever HTC is bringing to the table. But I, I consider this, at, if, if this is five inches, exactly five inches, I do think of it as more of a, uh, an upmarket 1X or a, you know, a refreshed the 1X than I, than I would think of it as a, as a Galaxy Note competitor, personally. 
No, I, I agree, but that's also kind of a funny thing to say in upmarket 1x, because the 1x was supposed to be the top of the market, right? Uh, and, and I think that's also the point that Ross is getting at. But to answer his question, I don't feel like HTC got too much wrong with the One Series, aside from the Sense software, which Chris and I have been moaned at length. Um, so, but but again, if if you want to fix Sense, the, there's a very easy way to do it. That's a software thing. Um, you don't fix Sense by introducing a 1080p display and just stretching it out over a larger display. Uh, I, I think Chris's point is, is exactly accurate. Like HTC has had issues with its financials, which we'll discuss uh, in a little bit. Um, it's not making the profit it used to be making, and it's losing sales. And like, like Chris says, if HTC can get out ahead of Samsung and actually hold on to the spec lead in Android for a prolonged period of time, um, you know that might be the thing that fixes things for for the company. So, so that that's yeah. my re reasoning, I guess, for you know going for for this kind of aggressive thing. But then the other thing is, if LG um, has this five inch 1080p display, why wouldn't you want to use it? Like, why would you let somebody else grab it? Well, here here's my question though. Why and I've 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 mentioned this many times before on this show and on the podcast before it. Why in the world do you need a pixel density in excess of 400 ppi on a mobile device or any device? Can somebody answer? Oh, that? dude, dude, th this this happened actually uh, in in the comment thread on our news report on this five inch HD superphone. Uh, you know, like the first couple of comments were like, it's overkill, it's unnecessary, it's too much. And then right. the responses to those were, well, yeah, but I mean, what, what was the response specifically? Well, the point is that you, you say it's too much, but if you if you, you take that perspective, you never move forward. You know, I, I'm, I'm actually one of those guys who was really quite content with monochrome displays back in the day. Uh, <laughs> Again, I've kind of mentioned this before. The first color displays really sucked on phones, so they weren't all that attractive. But then people were actually asking, "Well, okay, you're only looking at text messages, snake, and phone numbers. Why do you need a color display?" And the point is, you can't answer the question, "Why do you need a 1080p display?" until you have one, and then people start putting it to use. Well, I mean, I, I don't know the answer to my head other than 1080p movies. So here's my perspective. I, I think that that uh, 1080p in a mobile display is the most clear-cut example of a specs pissing contest that I can recall in, in recent memory. I mean, this has been a problem for a very long time in the Android space, but this there is no more clear demonstration of that than with this particular spec. What I would like to see uh, uh, com uh, component providers and OEMs do instead is concentrate on taking these uh, four to five inch or you know four to four point eight inch. 720p displays and start working on technologies for uh, better daylight viewability, uh, better uh, viewing angles, uh, better you know laminated display technologies because that's the kind of stuff that you notice every single second that you're using the device. Um, and it, you know of course the, the 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 Sony source component on the One X is already absolutely fantastic. It's I think I rated it a 10 if I remember correctly. Yeah. And I can't. It's not possible to make a display much better than that, I, I think, on a, on, on a mobile device. But one area where they, they could improve, where they can always improve, is daylight viewability. Um, so, in fact, we were, we were talking about this on last week's show, those old transflective displays on the, the IPAX from the early 2000s. Like, it, it, it actually got better when you were viewing the display in sunlight than it, than it was indoors. And, you know, it, at some point, hopefully, we'll get to that point again where it's just as good in, in direct sunlight as it is anywhere else um so i'd like to see them work on that and then then rather than resolution at this point so wait is that to say that we're hitting this kind of zenith point uh where we don't need higher resolution if we're gonna have a 4k televisions we don't need a 1080p phone or a 2k phone at some point uh i mean well here's, here's my question to you christopher flags i don't have an answer to this what is the highest pixel density of a phone you've seen or that's been out so far um probably uh, be your, the resound I, I guess four point three inch seven twenty p. Yeah, I think so. That that would be that would be the most yeah. uh, popular recent one. I mean, 
Yeah, I can't think of anything else. I mean, obviously, the I believe the Xperia S matches it with 720p at 4.3 inches. Um, but I don't think that's a better display. But in any case, yeah, I, th I think those are the densest ones, 4.3 inches with uh, 720p. I mean, I I'm with you, Chris, actually. Like, in, in practical terms, when you think about it, even though this display we're talking about is a 1080p one, uh, it is actually five inches, which makes it even bigger. Whereas I've already been on the record complaining that 4.7 inches in itself is a bit too bulky for me. So for a whole, bun right. whole bunch of people, um, you have the HTC One X, you have, as you say, the best display technology we've seen on the phone yet. Uh, it looks superb, but it's big. And now you're just making it bigger and you're not going to have the same display technology because LG isn't the company that built uh, the display in the One X and um, its IPS displays have generally, not not always, but generally been that slight bit worse than the IPS displays that have been inside the iPhone. You know, so so you might see exp an expansion in size, which for most people isn't going to be a benefit, and a decrease in quality. So actually, this is really deflating the whole room. I was excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm here to do, man. I mean, keep in mind, going back to the announcement of the iPhone 4 and the whole concept of the retina display is that it's that pixel density at which uh, individual pixels can no longer be perceived. And that's, what, somewhere around 275 PPI, I think? And yeah. beyond that, it's it's unclear what... I mean, no one has given me um, a logical answer when I ask... Um, it you know what is the the actual material advantage of pushing a pixel density beyond that? I mean because you know even if you're watching say a 1080p movie or in the future down the road of a 4K movie, you're going to end up you know you're not going to be able to perceive the uh, pixels that are that small. So you would downscale it anyway to uh, to 720p and it would look every bit as good at the same screen size. And so, well, yeah, it's a, I don't know. Well, to your point, it's the same screen size at the same retinal difference. Like, I'm not going to hold a phone up this close. Uh, what I will hold up that close, though, is maybe like a visor. And I can see this, like, the pixel density argument uh, continuing anew when we start getting to the Google Glass era, if they're really going to start pushing yeah. that. At that point, we'll start noticing pixel density at that level, a two inch, whatever. I don't know how big glasses are anymore. I, that's really bad right. for me to say right now, actually. And what's, so, the, so what's actually, the VR thing? The. Oh, the Oculus the Rift? The VR goggles? Yes. Yes, which yeah. is like, uh, I think like 640 by 320. Really, you, you can tell the pixels. That wasn't, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a good test case, but it's definitely far and away not ready for prime time. So yeah, yeah I was going saying? to ask about those, uh, I think they were 3D goggles that John Carmack had that you tested, Ross. What was yeah. the resolution on those? Uh, I think it's the Oculus Rift um, that's now on Kickstarter. I believe it was like 640 ah. by 320, 960 by 320, something like that. Uh, oh, I'm so off. Thank you, Nathan, my fact checker right here. Uh, 1280 by 800, but that's split uh, in half. So it's uh, essentially 640 or 720 per eye. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, hmm. so it, it's, uh, you can tell it's not good. Um, if you're, you know, if you have a good prescription, I, I did it without glasses, so I can't see very well. So it was really nice uh, and blurry, um, great complexion and all that. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, so the point is, like, I think, Chris, I think you you might have convinced me and swayed me. There is no point for a 1080p 5-inch phone, or at least nothing beyond that. Um, but going forward, I think the next pixel density battle is going to be once we get screens closer to us by necessity, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality headsets, I think then this whole screen war begins anew. Uh, that said, I'm actually right. a little I'm a little sad to think that we're hitting this kind of breaking point with cell phone density that we just don't need a higher resolution. Like, we've hit this kind of pinnacle where uh, it becomes kind of a moot point. Yeah. Well, I think well, if, we, that, if yeah. we look at... Sorry, Chris. But if, if we look at um, Apple's history with pushing resolution and pushing the retina branding, one of the noticeable things... Uh, for me, is that Apple didn't just raise the resolution of its displays, it really raised the quality. So when it did it with the iPhone 4, it was a so much better display than it had in the iPhone 3GS. Uh, when, it, when it called a retina display the really high resolution one in the new iPad of this year, 
again, everybody was fawning over it. They were like, this is the best display I've seen anywhere, ever. And when they did it with the Retina MacBook Pro, same situation. So I do feel like in Apple's case, there's a there's both a raise in resolution and a raise in quality, which kind of meshes and gives meaning to the whole Retina branding. And, and it also gives value and, and something that people can actually, you know, feel, right? Whereas opposed to if you just double up the resolution or quadruple the resolution, whatever, um, but leave the quality the same or worse, you, you degrade the quality in order to get more pixels in, ultimately people aren't going to appreciate it and like it as much. So yeah. I think I think that's that's the difference that they made. Maybe HTC is kind of falling into that pitfall of thinking we'll sell more phones if we can say we're the only 1080p phone on the market, which they, which they might very well do. Um, right. But it is exactly as Chris says, uh, turning into a bit of a pissing contest thing. And I'm I'm not even sure. I mean, how psyched are people about specs anymore? I I can kind of see them catching on to like branding messages like i say with, with retina with apple it's like does it have the retina display they already know what it means but it's so widespread you can pick it up but if it's like a 1080p versus a 720p display then it becomes a spec comparison as opposed to a big branding message that you can you know attach yourself to i think there's, so there's I, a I certain population i think there's a certain population of the market that is still receptive to um uh you know what, what number is bigger and they, they may not even necessarily know what that number means. They just say, well, this number is 1080 and this number is 720. I want the bigger number. Um, and, and, and to be honest, I think that, that sometimes it's those kinds of silly things that factor into how carriers price devices. Um, you know? and, and of course, to your point, Vlad, there are also certain specs that are, are very prominent and very well known, or there, there are certain branded specs that people understand LTE is a big one right now that all the carriers are pushing, and of course yeah. Retina as well. Uh, so it, we'll see. We'll see. It's going to be. I mean, I, I, th I think that people might uh, be able to equate 1080p to their TVs because you know for the past decade, you know, uh, six years to a decade, um, HD TV really saturated the television market, and so consumers are probably still used to being sold on you know 720p and 1080p. There, maybe that number will you know, it's still in their brain somewhere. And they, when they see that on a phone, it's going to uh, register for them. So we'll see. Sure. Um, and ju just to wrap up uh, this five inch phone, I, I do feel like the rest of the specs are very much in line with what HC has been doing in terms of just pushing every single thing. Uh, the Geo Benchmark result mentioned Adreno 320 graphics, which means Snapdragon S4 chip. Um, and we haven't had any that I recall, at least, any phones that are released with the 320, the upgraded graphics chip for this year. So that's going to make it one of the, you know, hands down best performing devices. Um, and, you know, pairing that with 1080p display and all of that stuff is just going to make a spectacular recipe in terms of specs. Right. But I, yeah. I mean, I also kind of fear that you've already got plenty, plenty of specs and firepower with the One S and the One X. So, you know, even if you double it up, I mean, what is there to use it? Like, what are you going to do? Are you going to actually start encoding 1080p video um, and, you know, start editing and doing all of that stuff? Uh, how does Creighton feel about that, our video producer? <laughs> You're not really going to do that, right? So, well, all of this processing power also kind of seems to be going the same way as all the resolution. Well, I, I have a, a much more important question to pose to you guys regarding this device, which is what's a better name, the HTC One Two, or the HTC Two X? One uh, XL. Oh wait, they did. No, that's already been done. Yeah. yeah. Shoot. Yeah, that already happened. Uh, XXL. I kind of like One Two. I don't see HTC doing that at all. <laughs> <laughs> and then they can do One Two Three, and it can be like a whole thing. It'll be their shtick. Oh, you know, uh, they keep adding numbers. Creighton is chiming in one, two, but comma, T-O-O, -O, the one also. This is why Creighton does not do branding for major uh, cell phone <laughs> manufacturers. <laughs> this is why um, all of us don't do branding. Come on. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I actually true. miss those aggressive uh, adjective names. 
the one series just kind of feels a bit too austere to me now. Maybe HC well, just you know, needs to get back. I, I would just like to make the same pa- the same point that I make on every single show, which is that uh, mega is an underutilized uh, term in cell phone names. So HTC One Mega might be good, or HTC Mega One. I'm just going to throw those yeah. out there. I like those. See what sticks. Uh, some of the commenters, uh, they said One Mega. We've got the HTC XXL. We've got the 2X. We've got the HTC One Up. Actually, I kind of like that. <laughs> uh, and, of course, the HTC FastCast. Thank you, Greasy Talkie aficionado. Uh, longtime listeners of uh, the Verge mobile podcast and even the Engadget mobile podcast will recall the HTC Bacon, <laughs> which still hasn't been used as far as I know. So uh, maybe they <laughs> was can that use one that of your well. inventions, Chris? No, that was a commenter, uh, I believe, on an Engadget mobile podcast several years ago, uh, and I think Neilai was a special guest on that show, if I if memory serves me correctly. And somehow the topic of HTC phone names came up. Uh, but we we should we we're not even done talking about HTC. We have a bunch of different HTC things to talk about, right? Okay. Right. Big news. Well, let's make a quick mention of the menu button up, up, update slash upgrade, which. Deezer has been extremely excited and happy about. Yeah. Yeah. This isn't a quick mention thing, Vlad. This is big news in the Android world. This sent shockwaves. It doesn't fix sense. It, it, it fixes one <laughs> of Sense's many flaws. No, th- this is, uh, I think you're significantly underestimating the importance of this. The, the, fact, that, the fact that HTC, I, never mind the specific change, right? The fact that HTC is proactively responding to a very common complaint about uh, like UX complaint about their existing skin without upgrading to a new version of Android and and going out there and patching and actually changing the functionality is pretty crazy. And I I think it's it's more or less without precedent. So uh, that's that's an encouraging sign that they're out there very, very closely listening to people. They're they've obviously been trawling through threads on XDA and probably some of our sites. Um, and, uh, it, this is, I think this is really, a really positive sign for the way they're going. That's not to say that I think that sense four is where it needs to be. And we've talked about this at length, but this is uh, this is a very good sign. By the way, for those of you who don't know, have no clue what we're talking about it. Um, the, the problem that HTC has with the one X and the one S is that there's no menu bar, uh, or excuse me, no menu button on the fixed row of buttons at the bottom of the device. So for legacy applications that haven't been updated to move the menu up into the action bar, like you're supposed to, uh, supposed to with Google's Holo design guidelines, uh, you get this, um, this extra soft uh, uh, button bar across the bottom of the screen that takes up an additional, what is it, 100, meg- uh, 100 pixels or something, with just a single button on it that's center uh, aligned that is three vertical dots which is the menu indicator in Android 4.0. So it looks weird. It's, it's bad. Um, and we called them out for it in our review and they, they went back and, and, uh, and patched it so that it, you, you don't, you can actually change the functionality of the multitasking button to be a menu button now. Yeah. I think it's pretty cool. Do you need to hold it down or how yeah. does that work? I, yeah, there's a. I haven't. Uh, I haven't updated mine, so I haven't played with it yet. But this is where we need Dieter because Dieter is like the biggest one X fanatic in the world, and he would be able to talk about this at length. But I think you need to hold it down for a second or two. But but the the point is that that virtual bar is now gone, uh, which was one of the biggest annoyances of not having not adopting the Galaxy Nexus style um, uh, virtual bar or the way the Galaxy S3 does it, where they have a, a hard menu button. All right. Well. Just to, just to say though, you said it's uh, unprecedented for HTC to adjust the software response to feedback, which is true in terms of like adjusting the like the fundamental and the really basic uh, interface and interaction. Um, yeah. But let's not forget that the company has always been very attentive to feedback. Uh, if you remember back when the bootloaders were being locked down, and then they did the unlock bootloaders. And when they announced they wouldn't upgrade the Galaxy, the HC, not the Galaxy, what am I talking about? The desire to gingerbread. And I mean, the, all of these things have, uh, <laughs> I mean, they're not HC's happiest moments in the company's history, 
But they have illustrated that when people have cried out and complained about something, companies really try to make an effort. Like the, the point about the desire is it, it announced it wouldn't get the upgrade, but then everybody really complained uh, vociferously. And I think HC chopped out a couple of features just to get that upgrade in there, uh, which, which is good. You know, I mean, it's, a, it's how companies should behave, yeah. and how they should react. Yep. And, and why should they act that way? Because they're having trouble in, uh, in the financial side of the business. Nice transition. That was, I planned that one. I, I had that, that waiting for a while. That was, I'm a, I'm a little proud of myself right now. That was, that was perfectly timed, perfectly executed. But Vlad, I'm going to rely on you to talk about this because I'm not good with numbers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nice cop out. But uh, well, what's <laughs> happened with HCC? They reported their second quarter revenues. I mean, HCC also, the funny thing with them is that their financial reports are kind of all over the map. So they report an audited numbers at the beginning of a given month, and then three or four weeks later to get around to auditing them. Uh, so we end up, you know, usually writing two posts, one to say HCC's quarter for this year is such and such. The other one is, yes, somebody rubber stamped it, et cetera. Um, and then there was a third uh, part to this, uh, this time around, where HCC reported specific numbers for the month of, uh, what month just expired? July? Now, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm so out of it today. Um, and they also gave a forecast for quarter three, which actually is not a very happy forecast. Like HCC saying, it had one of its roughest uh, first quarters of the year this year. It improved in the second quarter, but it's actually forecasting that things are going to go back to being as tough as in the first quarter. Um, which to me is kind of odd because the first quarter you could say, well, look at what HC had to present to people. Okay, the resound was a strong phone, but most of its lineup, uh, like we we're saying, was things like the Sensation XL um, and just uninspiring kind of old designs. Uh, the One Series came in, it really refreshed things. It really came up with good designs, uh, you know, unique selling points like the One X's display and the One S's thinness and the image sense mm -hmm. camera suite and all of these things. So you kind of thought, well, okay, they've corrected themselves in the second quarter and now it's on the up and up. But then they're predicting that things won't go on the up and up, which honestly kind of leaves me befuddled. I don't really understand this. Like the Galaxy S3 is a great phone, um, but how it's managed to sell like well over 10 million units versus the HC One X, which doesn't seem to be generating enough of a profit for HTC, it just befuddles me because I see those phones as being much closer than that. I think there are a few explanations. Um, I, I mean, you, you can't deny the sheer force and momentum of Samsung's scale, right? This is one of the largest corporations in the world Versus, uh, you know, going up against HTC, and so they can, sure. they have, they have the, um, the 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 manpower and the resources to put the full court press on literally every carrier of import around the world simultaneously. And you saw that happen with with the S3 and how well coordinated that launch was. Um, and and I think that Samsung, you know, of course, we, you know, we're seeing a lot of this come out in the Apple versus Samsung trial. Uh, but I, I think that they're, they're finally learning how to get their ducks in a row and become a very innovative force, not just in, in the Android space, but in the smartphone space overall. Uh, and that makes them very dangerous considering how profitable they are uh, every quarter. And of course, there's the, the undeniable advantage of making your own processors uh, and memory and flash and displays. Uh, and that's an advantage that HTC doesn't have. And we've seen all these predictions from analysts over the past year and I think this is kind of heated up over the past couple months in particular, saying that long term, there are only two players capable of surviving this brutal business, Apple and Samsung. Everybody else is just going to kind of peter out and, and die, uh, which, <laughs> which is really sad considering what great devices HTC makes and what great devices Nokia makes. Um, and, you know, obviously, we, we, it's to everybody's benefit to see those companies survive, even if you don't own their, their devices. So, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's just a brutal business. Yeah, but at the same time, actually, if we bring it back to HTC, their launch of the One X here in the UK was accompanied by a huge marketing storm. 
um, you know, there's a, there's a few free papers floating about London, uh, which had, um, you, you know, the, their outside covers were plastered with 1X promotional stuff on the front and the back, and then you had the paper inside it. Um, every carrier in the UK was, uh, or at least seemed to be spending quite a bit of money promoting that handset. When HTC introduced the 1X, it said that carriers have never loved a phone or a series of phones as much uh, as they've loved the One Series. So there was already a whole bunch of carrier buy-in. Uh, it wasn't like the phones were launched without the commensurate uh, amount of hype and promotional material around them. And yet, and yet there's, still that, there's still that gap uh, between them and the Galaxy S3, which, I don't know, I, I still can't explain to myself. And also to your point, Chris, about what people are predicting about long-term, the thing about long-term predictions is that they all suck, right? We, we actually had this conversation in our chat channel today where we we're like, Samsung is uh, today's Sony, right? And then somebody yeah. is, uh, well, Samsung is yesterday's Sony. Uh, and then somebody in Sony is yesterday's Sega. And, you know, you go <laughs> Wait, into so, a really... So that is mean, by the way, that is very mean to say well, that. It's, it's kind of true, though. It's very true. Um, so, Vlad, I want to cut in just for one second. Um, it's interesting you mentioned, like, HTC's campaign. Uh, Chris, correct me if you've seen differently, but I will say uh, in the United States, uh, Samsung has gone crazy with the ad campaigns. It's in front of every single movie, uh, in front of every single yeah. newspaper, magazine, flyer. Yeah. Uh, it was all over the Olympics, and that's, of course, global. Um, if HTC had a huge ad campaign here, it was very short-lived. I don't remember too much of it, especially in the video realm. Uh, but Samsung has the budget, I guess, arguably, to just go all out and just advertise everywhere, a ridiculous yep. amount. Um, yeah, the, the entire city of Chicago is plastered in yep. Galaxy S3 ads right now. Um, I mean, okay, it, it's well, complete saturation. Uh, if you think Android, I mean, Samsung's point is to come out there and say, we're the only choice for that. Uh, and I think yep. they've done a great job. I mean, I don't see a lot for LG. HTC is maybe the one other uh, company besides Samsung that I'm seeing any advertisements for, and it's been a long time. And relative to Samsung's like weight of advertising and the huge campaign, it's minimal at best. Okay, well, I mean that's obviously uh, good to know. But like, the question I'm trying to get to the bottom of is whether it's just a matter of advertising saturation. Like, can you really? Um, I mean, obviously, you need a strong product to start with to promote, but then can you really just ensure success by just carpet bombing everyone? Maybe you can. Maybe you can. Well, uh, let, maybe me, that's uh, Vlad, uh, let me ask you, what, when you see HTC ads, what are they advertising with the One X? How are they showing it off? Uh, primarily over here in, in the UK, it was this, um, it was this video of uh, skydivers. Skydivers and taking photos with the One X, uh, oh, yeah. showing off right, right. that it can it can take photos really quickly, etc. Um, and you know that it's so edgy and sporty and fun and super quick and stuff. It's interesting, yeah. And what we see over here is the uh, the Samsung sharing. They will not stop talking about NFC bump sharing, which yes, I don't think that's that's not even unique to Galaxy S3, is it? I mean, that's a Android feature. I think that they enhanced it, but they enhanced right. it in the same way that that um, Android 4.1 enhances it. Like it, you know, it can it can uh, transfer more types of information and larger chunks of information than uh, Android Beam could in yeah. 4.0. So yeah, it it it, uh, it also uses Wi-Fi Direct between the phones, uh, yeah. but unhelpfully, it's not universal Wi-Fi Direct connectivity. It's only Samsung phones. Uh, of which the only supporting device is the Galaxy S3. Right. Uh, but yeah, basically you can initiate a link between two Galaxy S3s by bumping them with the NFC connection. And then from that, you can establish a Wi-Fi direct, which means you don't need to have them side by side. Then they're just kind of, then they're just working with their wireless radios, the Wi-Fi radio. Right. So Apple's, or not Apple, sorry, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, Samsung's entire ad campaign for this is like, this is what we can do that no one else can do uh, as far as we want you to know. Uh, and they're doing, a pretty good, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. They're, they're doing a pretty good job at doing that. I think they've taken a page from Apple's playbook, which is to say, let's show functionality. Let's not say this is just a sexy device that has these specs and can go this fast. We're just going to say, you can do this with our phone. And the assumption is it's only our phone and it's something no one else can do. And by the way, we're everywhere. So you're just going to think about us anyway. Yeah, I mean, pretty much that. 
seems to be the case. I, yeah. would, I would factor a lot of it on their impressive ad campaign, name recognition, and the fact that there's just one Galaxy S3. It's not the Evo 4G LTE. It's not the uh, uh, the X, V, or S with varying qualities and varying tiers. Uh, Samsung's just come out with one flagship phone and has made it their baby across all carriers. I mean, right. technically, Samsung has come out with, I think, half a dozen phones. Yeah, well, they're, only, they're, they're only advertising the one, though. Uh, right, the yeah. The S3. Right. I mean, and I the think Galaxy those... Yes, the Plus, the Mini, the something... Uh, the, Hypo, there's like turbo the, 4G. I think there's a Galaxy S Ace 2. Like, how how did you manage to get the two <laughs> of a of a phone that nobody ever cared or knew about? I, I think that like most that. of those. But, but then, but then may, maybe maybe Samsung is such a massive company that it might even be operating like two separate businesses, where one is the old fashioned, you know, churn out as many phones as you can. Try and reach the low price points, sell it to uh, you know developing markets, emerging markets, yada yada yada, and then a separate business which is like the beat Apple uh, section of the office, basically where they just, where they just say, okay, Apple's doing this, we're gonna do it, but just differently enough so we don't get sued into oblivion. I don't think you're that far off. I think that uh, that, that they definitely are still producing a wide variety of nameless you know, practically nameless devices with the sole goal of, of placating their, uh, you know, their, their sold in carrier base. Uh, they, you know, they know that they have all these slots they need to fill and they're just like, ah, you know, we have such scale. We can, we can pump out, you know, a, a dozen bespoke models for Metro PCS if, if we want to. And, it, you know, nobody cares and they'll sell 5,000 and no, you know, it's, it's fine. And then they have their their real Samsung strategy, which is that the S3, the Note, and uh, and now the Note 10.1, and all that is built around the Samsung ecosystem and things like uh, like AllShare, and you know that ties into what they're doing, trying to do in the living room, and you know that's 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 the real Samsung, as far as I'm concerned. The rest is just you know ma- you know make a quick buck by selling into these carriers that are expecting us to fill these slots. Yeah, that's fair enough. But um, I, I, I was just thinking uh, on on that point actually, because uh, you, you're saying just a little earlier, Chris, about the Note 2 that uh, uh, it might come out. Uh, I think Samsung has already made it official that it's announcing the Note 2. Uh, yeah, I, I believe so. So it's that it's definitely announcing the Note 2 at the end of August at IFA. Um, which you know the the rumor and the speculation and the expectation was that it would be a five point five inch device and be all sorts of amazing whatever. Um, but do, do you think Samsung would at any point just kind of say, "Well, actually, these are our top three selling devices. This is our range of devices." Uh, say the Galaxy S three, uh, you know, the flagship regular smartphone, the Note uh, or Note two or Note whatever in the five inches uh, middle ground, whatever, like, like uh, Ross was saying, a phablet range, and then something like the Note 10.1 for the full-size tablet. Do you think Samsung will ever get to the stage where it will say, okay, we're just going to work on these three products? <laughs> and that will be our I don't, range. I don't think they're, they're showing any signs of that. Let's put it that way. I mean, I, the, the Galaxy S... I mean, maybe they're trying to set a precedent with the way they handled the Galaxy S3 launch, but I I don't think so. I, I I'm not I'm not seeing that. If if you look at some of the court documents and look at at the um, at the roadmaps uh, that they have for 2012, I mean, there's all sorts of weird garbage uh, on the the mid range and low end uh, for for the U.S. market on all these carriers, and it, it you know I think that. Samsung has the design and manufacture of these meaningless devices down to such a science that the, their development costs are as close to zero as they could possibly be. And so it's, it's almost to the point where these things are just pure profit. As long as carriers are saying, we want this stupid phone with this keyboard and, and it's got to have a, a button to our web portal on the keyboard and junk like that, as long as carriers keep saying that and paying for them to range them, Samsung is going to be one of the companies that that honors those requests, along with Huawei and ZTE in the long term. I think that you're going to see, I mean, obviously, Apple doesn't play that game. Nokia, I don't think, is, is going to, to, to ever play that game. Um, and I don't think Sony is either. 
So on the, on the subject of companies who appease carriers as a matter of course, uh, <laughs> we've done a bit more coverage on Rim's fortunes and fate recently. Um, and I'm hoping one of you guys actually bothered to read this stuff <laughs> because it <laughs> kind of slipped by me. Uh, well, but so... Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so, 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 so let's just say that uh, if you haven't read uh, Jesse's piece, Jesse actually... Uh, lives in Metro Detroit, which is not far from uh, from Waterloo, which of course is Rim headquarters. Uh, so he he traveled up there and um, and and talked to some of the people in Waterloo to see how Rim's fortunes and misfortunes actually affect people um, on the ground. And and I and please take the time to read this piece because it's a very interesting piece. And of course, Jesse had uh, a Rim piece that went up uh, what was it two or three months ago as well. And you should read both of those those articles um, because it's it, it t it's a really fascinating look at the decline of uh, the company and, and what it means for the local economy. But um, uh, what what fascinated me about this piece is how uh, how <laughs> how these people are realists. <laughs> I mean, I guess that shouldn't be a surprise, right? That um, it, you 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 wouldn't expect I mean, these are smart people. Uh, they're they're good people, and you wouldn't expect them to be fleeced by Rim necessarily. But they they I mean, most of the people that he talked to are realists about Rim's fortunes and where they stand in the market and what their opportunities are. And um, and it's it's uh, it's kind of it, it's it's sad it's sad to read, and, and it really makes you hope that that Rim finds a way to uh, to make it in this market. But it's. Uh, I don't know where they're going to go from here. Torsten Hines has not shown me anything that 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 proves that he is able to lead this company out of the nightmare that it's in. Um, and that's not to say anything about whether he's a good CEO or not, because I don't think I think that that all the you know, every single possible uh, set of odds was stacked against him by the time he took the helm. It's uh, it's squarely mm -hmm. on Jim Belsilli and Mike Lazaridis, who brought that company to where it is today. It's it's not not Heinz. So I don't think we can really make any ruling on what kind of guy he is. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a good piece. Um, uh, please take the time to read it. Uh, do your, do your, uh, uh, pocket or however it is that you, uh, read these sorts of things. Um, but, but speaking of Heinz, we should, we should talk a little bit about this latest, uh, thing that he's saying, which kind of goes along with what he's been saying along with. It's the strongest. He, now he's saying, uh, he's hinting very strongly that uh, they could license BlackBerry 10 because RIM itself is not able to achieve the economies of scale uh, that it needs to to compete with who it needs to compete with in the smartphone market. Um, and I, I think the, the perennial question <laughs> that everyone has been asking since day one is who would license BlackBerry 10 and why? Uh, so I, 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 I want to get your guys' take. Who, who do you think would realistically license BlackBerry 10 and what good would it, would it do them? Um, I would need BlackBerry 10 to exist, first of all, but uh, <laughs> let, let's hear Russ's answer. Um, I don't have a much better answer. I was going to say Samsung because why not? Uh, <laughs> they have everything else. They make Windows phones that are, by the way, really bad. You can definitely tell where Samsung actually cares to put its design in. Um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like those... You know, people. If if Rim can leverage any carrier, uh, and I don't know if it can anymore, but if it can, it could maybe talk to the people who do make those orders for carriers: the Samsungs, the Huawei's, the ZTEs. Uh, I don't see anyone going like really jumping at this, saying this is the way I'm going to differentiate. I'm going to get a BlackBerry 10 device uh, out there. I'm going to manufacture one. I don't see anyone really wanting to do that. Anything I've seen from BlackBerry 10 doesn't impress me enough beyond Windows Phone or Android. Which have become more the de facto choice. Yeah, yeah. I, I think. Yeah, the, no, I, I, I agree. I, I think the only opportunity that that they have here is for an OEM to get fed up with um, Google shenanigans or Microsoft shenanigans enough to say, you know, we the the only way we can do this, the only way we can continue to make phones the way we want to make them is to go a different direction that has a chance of surviving. And they might be led to believe that the only way to do that is to license something that has a name brand 
and is already built and exists and um, and kind of does everything that it needs to do as an operating system. And of course, that would be BlackBerry 10. The other <laughs> the other option would be uh, Open Web OS, I guess. But uh, <laughs> it's not not showing any signs of doing anything interesting. Tizen, so, um, all about the Tizen. Uh, uh, yes, right, Tizen, which uh, is what the fourth or fifth uh, transformation of that platform started <laughs> as uh, uh, Moblin, right? Moblin, and then Migo and MIMO and all this jazz. So, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. the only thing that I can, I can think. Um, I don't know who that would be. I don't know if that would be a ZTE or a Huawei or, or what. I don't know. It would be nobody, Chris. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's, so, much, uh, there's so much wishful thinking slash uh, conditional circumstances that you need in order for somebody to even give a damn about licensing BlackBerry 10. It's it's silly. Yeah. I mean, when you're saying that the people of Waterloo are realists, uh, my interpretation of that is basically that they're leaving town, because that that's the only thing a realist can do in the circumstances that Rim is in. And when you said uh, we can't judge Thorsten Hines as a CEO, I completely agree, and I don't think we'll ever be able to judge him because, as far as I'm concerned, he's stuck in this sequence. Like, if if you think of the CEO's job as a game of chess. He's stuck in the sequence where he's basically being repeatedly and very slowly, very methodically being taken apart. And he's trying to do the right move, but there's only one right move, which is always the wrong move. So the best he can do is, you know, make the least wrong move in these circumstances. <laughs> I don't even know what that is anymore. I don't. And yeah. OK, there's only two circumstances in which... Um, BlackBerry 10 licensing would ever be a significant thing in the mobile market. One is if BlackBerry 10 is amazing, it actually compels people to go and use it, which would be such a such a high standard because everybody who's taken up Windows Phone has clashed with the fact it doesn't have an app ecosystem. Um, and it, it's the reason why people are sticking with Android as, as long and as much as they are, because it has a built-in ecosystem. Um, and, you know, people will dance to Google's tune because so much is kind of given to them and so much is there already in the software. Yeah. So, I mean, even if your profit margin isn't huge with Android, at least the things that your consumers seek are there. Right. With BlackBerry 10, you are extremely likely to have the full set of basic OS functionality to start with. Uh, if we use the BlackBerry playbook as an example, uh, I think it's a very instructive example. Um but even if you did, the app ecosystem will never be there from day one. So the idea that BB10 will be so compelling that guys like ZT will be thinking, yes, we license this, we get ahead of the curve, get ahead of everybody else. I, I just find that extremely unlikely. The other well, thing let me is, just play. Let me quick. let me just play real quick. Let me play de devil's advocate with you here because I think that's exactly what Black or what Rim is trying to do this year with um, the Black Raid Jam events. And uh, by delaying the platform into Q1 2013 is they're trying to make sure that they don't have another playbook on their hands. They want to come out of the gate, A, with, uh, with excited and ready developers, and B, with a functionally complete platform. Okay, but excited and ready developers are not an ecosystem. They are, uh, um, you know, to put it bluntly, they're like the sperm before the ecosystem. They're the seeds of one, right? But they're not right. an ecosystem in existence. So nobody's going to license BB10 in Q1 2013. And if nobody's licensing it then, how long is this game that Thorsten Heinz is playing? Because, I, I mean, his plans seem to actually extend beyond the point at which Rim needs to essentially sell out or go bankrupt. Like, that's, that's kind of the way that it seems to be. Uh, you know, going back to that old joke... Um, that somebody made in our comments, it was uh, Rumors postponed the release uh, of BlackBerry 10 until after it's shut down and gone bankrupt <laughs> and gone out of business, uh, yeah. which was a really neat way of summing it up. But yeah, the, the second scenario um, that I think you alluded to, Chris, is this idea that people feel, um, I guess, oppressed by Google in the Android ecosystem, oppressed by the fact they can't generate profits, which, you know, LG can't. But then LG has its other issues uh, that are not just related to Android. Um, and then maybe people don't feel like Windows Phone is competitive enough. And then out of desperation, they go and jump to a branded alternative. 
I just don't see that desperation happening within the next how many months until Q1 2013? What, seven, eight months? I just don't see that happening that quickly. Yeah. Yeah, they so are uh, just rude. They're in the proverbial hurt locker. You know what they really need? There's a, there's a lot of money to be made here in inventing uh, some sort of supercomputer, uh, the, the scale of which has never be, uh, before been seen in the supercomputing industry, where uh, Torsten Hines can sit down at a terminal and simulate in, in their entirety every possible scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, where, like, you know, if, if we sell then here's what happens if we if we don't sell here's what happens right down to like simulating individual consumers everywhere around the world and what they buy and why they buy it someone's got to come up with the software maybe it already exists and i just don't know anything about it because i'm not a businessman but someone needs to do that software we are being told uh dear listeners <laughs> uh by our by our uh production team that uh, our window uh, to broadcast is closing rapidly uh, so we uh, we are going to have to pick and choose from our remaining topics, um, and it's probably just as well because it's kind of slim pickings this week. Uh, should we talk very very quickly in like one minute about the T-Mobile My Touch? Uh, because David Pierce, who has been a guest on this program before, reviewed uh, these devices, and they are from Huawei. And uh, Vlad, I know that you're a huge Huawei fan, and and Ross, I think you are enormous, as well, actually. Enormous yeah. fan. Uh, yeah, Ross actually, little known uh, fact about Ross. Ross, uh, if you go into his home, he has a collection of every Huawei device ever released in the U.S., plus a, a selection of of, uh, of a few European and, and Asian Huawei devices. Some this rarities. fact is uh, so little known that I didn't even know it myself. <laughs> uh, uh, wow. I feel like I've come uh, to some but, kind of self-realization here. So here's the thing. Um, it, we don't need to talk too much about these because I already played with them before and we talked about them on the show. Um, it, they're, they're very mid range, uh, low end to mid range. And I feel like T-Mobile has been pushing the my touch line lower and lower and lower with each subsequent, uh, generation of device. They are very heavily carrier branded because T-Mobile is, uh, the owner of the my touch brand. This isn't like a, a global range for them. This is a, a bespoke device or set of devices from Huawei that they made specifically for T-Mobile. Um, and I think that David sums it up very nicely. They, these could have been, say, six and a half to seven scoring devices on one condition if they ran Android 4 4.1 out of the gate. The fact that they are launching in August of 2012 with uh, Android 2.3 is it, it's not even oh. ridiculous anymore. It's just right. it, there, there isn't a word in the English language to describe this travesty. I don't, I don't want to badmouth David, but I think we did score these a little too high. I think it's 6.6. <laughs> for a phone that I can't possibly recommend to anybody at any given moment is a little, it's a little too nice. It's too forgiving. It's definitely Huawei fanboyism at its finest. Uh, to give <laughs> so, so we're limited in recording time and we're discussing gingerbread phones. Uh, I feel outraged <laughs> for all count. Okay, Vlad, you, you lead the way. T- tell me what you want to talk about. Yeah, what's next on the list? Okay, was it, was it, since we're talking about my outrage, um, Aaron from our... European team from our UK oh, team uh, wrote, he wrote, uh, this is my next uh, article, which, you know, on our website is uh, an homage for a device which we, or well, one particular member of our staff feels particularly passionate about and intends to purchase as his or her next gadget device machine uh, significant other. They do talk about, this is uh, the, uh, the latest deep dark desire from the world of technology is this is my next description uh aaron took deep and dark way way too seriously yes in this case. that's <laughs> yeah. just, that's a good way of putting it uh he, i mean neil i put it as this is the craziest thing we have ever published and he's probably accurate in that respect uh and the subject of aaron's desires and passions was actually the nokia 808 pew which uh Something that Ross mentioned before the before the show today was: Does Aaron actually know that this thing is a phone as opposed to a camera? <laughs> well, and that's the thing, right? Like we we've said before uh, that if Nokia had stripped this of its GSM radio and positioned it as a novelty, like you know, really cool point and shoot camera with like a giant touchscreen display on the back, they they probably could have could have sold it in a completely different way for less money. Uh, and it, it may have been moderately successful. I don't know. But now, because it's a, it's, you know, it's a Symbian phone, 
that completely changes the the landscape of how you sell this device and the kinds of people who are going to buy it, which is nobody. <laughs> no, no, just Aaron. I mean, come on now. Aaron, yes, there's Aaron. Excuse me. I mean, if you're going to spend uh, this mean, much money on a cutting edge camera, why not get the Lytro? I mean, it just seems if is he if he's using this as a phone, I haven't I haven't stomached to get through past like Graph Five. Uh, <laughs> Just, well, Vlad, what are you doing over there across the pond? I mean, you trained this man. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this yeah, is an extension um, of you. I hope you realize. And and I'm and I'm also the guy who introduced him to the 808 POV. So this is really just uh, uh, my influence playing havoc onto the world. Well, I, I think to to defend Aaron's point, which we've done really <laughs> unsuccessfully, <laughs> but to defend his point as his uh, local colleague. Uh, he, he does make the point that being on the cutting edge of technology is rarely a comfortable experience, right? So, so he's as far as he, he's concerned, the compromises of Symbian and the compromises of losing, essentially losing smartphone functionality when you're using the Adobe Peer View are okay. <laughs> Stop laughing, Ross. Come on now. <laughs> and, and, you know, he, he, he's never said that he wants this to be his only phone, Right. To him, this is the perfect secondary phone, which you might, um, which you might, you might be able to sympathize with, because if your secondary phone is just something you make phone calls with, and in this particular case, is something that you use specifically for photos, it can work. I mean, the thing that I know for a fact is that it really kind of blows to have this with a proper phone because it's bulky and heavy, and <laughs> carrying two phones around is a pain in every side. Um, so. Personally, I just I just feel he's wrong, but I mean he has a point. <laughs> he's wrong, but <laughs> he has a point. <laughs> to some degree, I mean I I can see, you know it's 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 empathy, right? Where you don't agree, but you can kind of see where a person is coming from. Well, I mean we can we can revisit this once uh, Pure Voy Pure View actually comes to a, a Windows phone. Pure Voy, there you go. This is what we call the, the HC phone. I would love to own a phone called Pure Voy. Pure Voy? You? Pure Voy? Pure Voy, yeah. Oh. It, it sounds classic. Word. It sounds kind of like Savoy or something. Um, but it, I know it's not a word. It, it just can't... It, it, you know how people make things sound French to make them sound classy? Well, that, that's it. Ah, uh, ah, uh, the, I, the, the see, at, at first, I, at first I thought you said Pure, pure Voy. At first I thought you said Pure French. Void. A V-O-I-D. Pure Void. And, and there are many different ways that you could take that. I was thinking like, you know, and this is this is going to be a little disgusting, but you know how like when you drink way too much water, that's like a pure void. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Like it's just, you know. I do, Chris. And you, 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 I think everybody got it, so we should just move on. <laughs> okay. Uh we should we should talk about exactly one more topic before Creighton kills us, and I think that should be our dead trigger interview, personally. Okay. Oh, Okay. Oh, well, before we do, before we do, uh, I want to um, repeat the shout out from earlier on for Brian uh, because he's he's killing it with the Apple and oh, Samsung yes. coverage. Like, he really is. I I know I work at the Verge, which makes me inherently biased, and I oh I'm sorry, not inherently biased, inherently biased, uh, <laughs> and I should not be trusted. But seriously, like I, I come to the site and I see how much first-hand reporting we have from the Apple and Samsung lawsuit, and I am just impressed. Like, and, and it's He's most of it is done by Brian, who's killing it. And but but that's not to say that he's my favorite news manager, Nathan, which might be you. <laughs> Uh, I actually want to say not just Brian. I want to say uh, to his Brian's had a great support uh, support staff. Neil I has been helping out a ton. Matt McCarry is our another resident legal expert we have. Uh, who can't yeah. be there at the trial in person. He's actually very depressed about that. Uh, he cries himself to sleep at night thinking about uh, reports and all that. But Matt is helping from a distance as much as he can. Uh, Neil is chiming in. Um, a bunch of, you know, a dozen other writers on staff have done everything they can to help Brian. Uh, it's been a huge collaborative effort. Obviously, Brian has been killing it in every single way possible. Um, and it's just a fascinating, like, it's a fascinating uh, case to watch. And clearly, yeah. the judge hates both sides so this is so the part much. that I love. This is the part that I love that the judge is just so finds the whole thing so repugnant. Like Apple and Samsung are getting into the nitty gritty and trying to argue this really woolly, you know, well, it looks like this, therefore such and such, such and such. 
Uh, and the judge is just like, oh, you guys disgust me. Go away. Yeah. I love those reactions. Yeah. I, lo I love those little outbursts. It's a, it's a wild case. And like literally every single day that the case has been progressing, there have been uh, really insane revelations that have come out of it or really insane rulings from the judge. And I have a feeling that's going to continue for the entire duration of the trial. So we have, um, we have uh, one of our very special story streams, you may have heard of them, devoted to this case. Um, and all of the news that's coming out of that case is getting attached to that story stream. We'll post the link to you uh, on the site uh, attached to the, the podcast post right. so that you can get right to that stream. And stay tuned later this week. Um, I'm sure on the Vergecast, Brian will make another cameo, as we're hoping he will every week, uh, and then some to talk about nice. the trial. Yes. We, we, need, we need some more West Coast bodies and West Coast accents uh, to, you know, diversify our video offerings. Does, does does Brian, I, I'm trying to think, I don't think Brian or Scott, or certainly not Dieter since he's not from the West Coast, but those guys don't really have quote unquote West Coast accents, do they? Do they? Uh, Maybe they do. I don't know. Um, we, we were talking about this a little early on when, uh, when we we're saying about mispronouncing things because you never actually hear people say them. You just read things. You just write That's them. Like yeah, read them and write them. Yeah. I don't yeah. actually know many people from The Verge. I, I just see texts from them. It's a Brave new world, man. Digital world. But yeah, okay, let's uh, let's discuss Dead Trigger uh, and this whole hype slash controversy slash whatever that has developed around it. Um, so Matt Finger Games, the guys who make Dead Trigger, uh, Shadow Gun, and Samurai, Samurai 2, some of the more popular mobile games. I spoke with their CEO, uh, Marek Rabas, and we just discussed the whole thing with um, Dead Trigger actually going to a free-to-pay... Free-to-pay? Yeah, I like that. <laughs> free-to-play <laughs> uh, monetization model. Uh, it used to be a paid app. It used to be 99 cents, uh, both on iOS and Android. It switched to a free-to-play model, and when it switched on Android... Uh, the word from Matt Finger uh, was that there's an unbelievably high rate of piracy on Android. Um, when it made the same switch on iOS, there wasn't the same outburst, which I think struck a lot of people as uh, kind of disingenuous because they didn't, you know, uh, you know, they didn't have the same outburst about iOS. Um, but but in any case, uh, what I did was I exchanged a few emails with him. We had a conversation about that, and he provided me with some stats uh, behind what, what they were saying. So on Android, the piracy rate is apparently 80%. Um, so 80% of players of Dead Trigger were playing unlicensed copies. Uh, and, and they're basically comparing their sales data versus uh, analytics data, which might not be perfect, but it gives you kind of a rough idea. Uh, and on iOS, it's 60%. And in general, the point from him is that it's it's an unsatisfactory situation for people. And they're kind of forced into the whole, uh, let's make it free to play. Let's make let's essentially nickel and dime people and just try and make make our money by selling tiny little things in the game, which to me is kind of annoying. I, I much prefer to pay for the game up front and then just enjoy it and use it and not have to pay real money again for small parts in it. Uh, I don't know how right. you feel, Chris. No, I, I, I totally agree. And I also want to point out that uh, I was shocked when, when he came out with the, um, the iOS piracy rate. I, you know, I, I assumed that it would be like single digits or something, but it's, it's nearly as outrageous as the Android number. So it's, just, it's like, what are these people? Th like, I, you know, I, I, I get that, that people don't like to pay for stuff. I get it. But you lose sight of the fact that there are real people doing real work to bring these games to the market. Um, and it's very easy to obscure that when you're looking at the at the Android market or your Google Play market. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a little dis, uh, disheartening. But uh, he did kind of he he was surprisingly upbeat, I would say, wouldn't you? I mean, I'm um, sure he's generated a lot of press from this. I'm sure it's helping his download rates and yeah, his, uh, yeah. his free to play model quite a bit to have it in the news. Yeah, so much. yeah. Just to, just to clarify, the CEO's name is Marek Rabas. Grabas? Okay. Rabas. Grabas, got it. Oh, 
Okay, got oh. it. I've got it. Okay. Listen, dude, it is late. I am tired and <laughs> I haven't had a drink in a while. Okay. A drink of water, obviously. Of water, yes. Uh, so <laughs> my lips are obviously parched. All right. Um, well, actually, I asked him about that, about whether this was essentially a ploy for publicity. And the thing that he said was that, um, and I mean, again, you kind of have to take him at his word here, uh, is that the company wasn't actually so happy about all the hype that came out of it. Uh, they were asked, why are you reducing the price to free? They said, uh, well, well, you know, they gave a blunt response. They said, well, it's really high parity rate. And honestly, I have to agree with that. If 80%, if that figure is legitimate of players of a 99 cent game are playing unlicensed copies, then something is really wrong there. That just, but I... beyond that, uh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. No, 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 because I mean, I'll get off on a tangent. Finish your thought. I'm sorry. Okay, but beyond that, what what, what I'm uh, what I got from him was that they actually had to spend a whole bunch of time answering questions from guys such as myself, and they had to dedicate a whole bunch of time repeating the same answers over and over again, uh, talking to people as opposed to you know using that time to produce, plan, etc., do whatever game studios do. So. You know, for them, it was a, it was a big uh, time sink, I, even if it, in, it, it increased, uh, you know, publicity, at, at least temporarily. Um, so I could kind of see that perspective. Uh, but you're going to launch it on tangent, Ross. Not so much a tangent. I, you know, I'm, I'm happy that he actually got back to you and kind of explained the kind of methodology of coming to that figure. Still, 60% seems really high. Um, and I was trying mm. to find, I couldn't find a good number for least cyanogen mod downloads to even get a feel for how big that is versus the entire iOS field. Um, it's interesting to see, is Shadow Gun and you know, Samurai 2 and Dead Trigger, uh, is that market just so uh, tied and connected to the jailbreak audience? Um, I find it surprising. Um, however, to disagree with both of you on the business model section, I'm actually really happy about free to play. I think it's actually quite an interesting model. And I'm curious to see kind of how it goes. You're offering something for free, getting people into it, giving you a free experience that's actually really high quality, and then kind of adding on to it. Of course, the question is what you do beyond that. Um, we've seen this kind of happen for a long time. Xbox Live um, has mandated demos for all its big releases. Um, so you have a somewhat free-to-play model there where you're getting a demo experience and you, play for, you, know, you pay for the full game. Uh, and you're seeing a lot of people experiment with obviously more disingenuous, sometimes even more genuous, uh, ideas, um, depending on how it affects the gameplay, specifically single versus multiplayer. I mean, I'm all, I'm all honestly for trying out this new business model. If it helps them, great for them. What is your specific concern with a free-to-play business model in this case? Well, let me give you a very specific example. This has nothing to do with Dead Trigger, but I want to give you a, a very specific example of where free-to-play is, uh, is super annoying, or freemium, I guess, would be the correct term here. Uh, Triple Town. Oh, Triple gosh. Town has the most annoying freemium model in history. And, you know, I mean, like, you, you're going to end up paying because, like, they, you know, they, it's brilliant. It's both brilliant and extremely annoying because you, you get a certain number of, like, moves. And then um, you run out of moves and you can't make any more moves unless you pay. Or you can wait some ridiculous amount of time to get a new move. And actually, I think a lot of those turn-based games work the same way, but it's it's super annoying in, no, that, in triple that is town because you terrible. You want to make you want to make like ten thousand moves every time you play, and you can only make like fifty, and then you have to pay like you know a, a dollar for a hundred moves or something. Right? No, no, that's that is insane and unfair. I don't necessarily like that model at all. But there are other other things you can do, like you can value it. I think Team Fortress Two, uh, Valve is of course an exception because they've made millions and billions of dollars, you know, pretty much just kind of doing what they want. And they have a loyal fan base. Uh, there are ways of making it work. I think they're still experimenting. That is a great example of a terrible way of making something free to play. Uh, yeah. I, I would, with, I'm with you. I'd much rather just pay ten dollars and just have unlimited moods for a game that. And I've played Triple Town. I'm with you on this. Uh, is a big waste of time, but I can't stop playing. Yeah. <laughs> well, ju just to make the, that distinction as well, um, because Marek was really keen to make it uh, between the idea of freemium, where you do have to pay to continue uh, and free to play. Like as far as he's concerned, there are two very distinct things because a free to play game is one that you can complete without ever needing to make any extra purchases versus a freemium one where you fundamentally can't get to the end of the game without making extra purchases. 
Now, a lot of people will say this, and a lot of people in comments have said this, Dead Trigger is more of a freemium game than it's free to play. Um, it, you basically have to go into the store, spend some real money in order to get a gun which will get you through the game in some reasonable amount of time as opposed to committing your entire life to grinding through it. Just, you know, mm-hmm. fine, that's a separate point. But um, the other thing, and then the thing that actually bothers me more is that, okay, if you pirate a 99 cent game, which relies on in-game purchases to begin with, you're not really going to uh, disturb the equilibrium too much. It, I mean, we know where the money's coming for for that game. But if you're doing that to games which cost $5, $8, $10, right? Things like Shadowgun uh, at release, then you're kind of undermining the entire market for games of that uh, class, right? Because in order right. for... I mean, and this isn't just games. This is applications as well. I mean, the reason apps are thriving as much as they are on Mac, on the desktop, is because people are buying them, right? And and small uh, kind of tailor-made apps, exactly the apps that you lack on Windows. I mean, if you get one of those apps on Windows, it gets pirated so quickly, and everybody knows it's pirated and available so quickly that nobody bothers to pay for it. Nobody bothers to go and invest however much cash in it. Um, Whereas on Mac, most people have been paying for it, and then you kind of get this culture, and you also get... um, you know, you also get the history of people making their money back when they invest in developing, uh, you know, more sophisticated, higher quality applications and games, uh, which right. again encourages further investment in the same thing. And that's not going to happen if we're going to, you know, power the crap out of these games. Right. right. That's the thing that bothers me. I, mean, I think the idea is that you can't stop piracy, but you can incentivize uh, purchasing in some way. Um, However, I guess to you know to the point of Madfinger is now that if you're going to pirate the game, you can only get so far. You have to pay for them at some point. Of course, someone will find a workaround for that too. But it's another level of a uh, of annoyance to the point where you just say, "Screw it, I'm going to give you a dollar because it's really not a big deal." Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean that's that's the thing. We we just we started off this uh, podcast last show talking about the HC Superfolk. And we started off with me excited because it has so much potential. Like, even when it comes out, that's what we'll be talking about. We're talking about the potential of a 1080p display and a crazy processor and LTE and all of those things. And we'll be like, well, actually, where are the games? Where are the things that make use of the Adreno 320 graphics? And they won't be there. And They and don't like exist. My, nope. Right. And, and my feeling, and it, this is a guilty feeling from my perspective as well, because... I, I don't make a ma- much of a habit of spending in app stores. I don't make much of a habit of pirating, but I just I just don't like spending in app stores precisely because when you spend little amounts, you never realize how much you're spending until you end up spending tons. So I try to refrain from that. But the guilty sense that I get is because I'm not doing that, I'm not encouraging the things that I want to see. Well, I think, right? so, I think there's also a more fundamental problem with uh, the Android marketplace, Google Play, and I'm not trying to hate on it too much um i could just be snarky and say well you can always get infinity blade 2 for your htc device because there's a bootleg version of that now available um, there is oh there was i don't know if they, they i don't know if they took it down it was up for breaking news hours. russ what the hell no it's <laughs> <laughs> i've never i've worked with vlad for a long time i've never heard him get that spontaneously excited about anything <laughs> i know it's actually quite a thing of beauty i uh, know there's that fake thing but the point is um i don't trust uh, the google play store uh, I have an inherent distrust of a store that's not vetted properly, where a fake Infinity Blade 2 can just be put on there uh, for many, many hours. Um, oh, the fake one, right. Yeah, the fake one. Sorry, it's not not actually real. Uh, but that, that's my point, though. Is like There is so much... Uh, I don't know if you say malware. I'm sure there's a lot of malware in the Google Play Store. It's just not vetted that much. Uh, there's a level of distrust among the consumer. I don't want to give money to these people uh, unless they're very, very trusted. And sifting through that... Is still a pain. The you know, it's a still a painful thing to do, even when there's editor's choice and there's trusted developers or whatever you want to do to differentiate. Um, I hate to give Apple credit for this, but the closed gate system of their marketplace really does stand out. Uh, and if Google pl- if Google wanted two marketplaces, one I can trust and one that's just everything, uh, I think I might learn to trust it a little more in that sense. Uh, for now, that extra freedom has led to a 
level where I'm not sure if I want to pay. Um, it doesn't mean I'm going to download. It just means you're not going to get as much of my money, and I'm not going to have as much of a trust level with paying for anything, much to Vlad's point. One thing that really helped was when they uh, used to have the 24-hour uh, return period, which yeah. uh, I think that they they came to the, con the conclusion that that was uh, inhibiting, like developers really hated that because it made it too easy to develop buyer's remorse over the course of a day and return the app. So they, they reduced that window to 15 minutes, which is barely long enough to download and install the app, much less... Uh, test it out and decide whether it actually is any good. So um, it, even if that were like an hour or two, that would, I think, make a big difference and, and kind of instill some confidence. Well, that it's that, there but you right also have to like, teach people that's an option and how to do it. it. Even when it was a 24 hour period, it wasn't always the most obvious uh, way of getting that, you know, getting to that right. return. Right. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I do feel like um, demo versions of any sort of software are just kind of inherently necessary and useful and helpful. Um, mm -hmm. And anybody who's, you know, pissing and moaning about they're not paying the upfront price because um, they think it's too high, but then you're not offering a demo version, you're kind of undermining your own argument. Because I always feel if, if I'm a software developer, right, I can give people a demonstration, I can give them an idea of my software, and then hope that they will find it useful enough to use long-term and pay the full price for. Like I, I always kind of prefer, I mean, this is a personal preference, but I prefer to just pay how much things cost. I, I personally hate the, the American thing with tipping because it's such a imprecise science and you're supposed to pass these subjective judgments about people's performance and yada, yada, yada. Whereas I'd much rather say, okay, just charge me however much it costs you to produce this food, uh, host the, these facilities, hire these people, et cetera, et cetera. And that would be that. Why do I have to tip? Why, why do we always have to get so granular with the payments and the money and all of this mess? It's a beautiful dream. Beautiful dream. Keep dreaming, Vlad. <laughs> Dude, it's real. It's called Europe. <laughs> oh, man. The American dream it's... is real. It's called Europe. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a that. quotable right there. So we, should, uh, we, we, should, we should wrap this thing, seriously. It's, right. it's rapid, rapid time. Vlad. It's it's wrapping time. It's uh, we're on the hour. We're precise, and mm -hmm. now I'm rambling, so <laughs> break it up that precision. But whatever. Okay. Uh, so quick. I just want to mention a couple of quick uh, news tidbits before we do run away. Microsoft has renamed the Windows Phone Marketplace to Windows Phone Store. So be excited. Uh, fewer syllables. Yay. And AT and T has apparently announced that it will shut down its 2G network by 2017. Chris, one sentence reaction. Who needs 2G? Boom, done. Uh, okay, so th does that count as a bum note, a down note to end the, the show on? I think so. 2G, you know, old school, uh, nostalgia, yeah. etc. Like yeah, maybe, maybe, be. maybe the first time you fell in love with someone, it was over a 2G call on AT and T's ultra reliable network. <laughs> Oh, that, that would have actually far. made a good. Uh, that that would have made a good uh, cold open right there, Vlad. You you were onto something there, you know, falling in love with someone two G network. You could have made that work. Yeah, if, if I was actually awake time. when I was doing the introduction, uh, it would have been beautiful. <laughs> uh, but that's we'll another beautiful you. dream. Um, but anyway, you can keep in touch with us. You can keep track of us on theverge.com, a website available on the internet. You can find us on Twitter. I'm at Vlad Savov. Uh, Chris is at Z Power. As you know, uh, Ross is at Ono Roscoe. Nathan, what's Nathan's uh, Twitter handle? Anybody? Nathan Ng. Anybody? He's looking. It's Nathan Ng, I think. <laughs> at, wait, what? <laughs> at Nate Ingram. Nate Ingram. At Nate Ingram. Nate Ingram, which Nate Ingram. is I N G R A H A M. Yes. Wow, that was good. I know, I know my people's names, even if I don't know their Twitter handles. Uh, All together, we are at Verge. You can email us actually. We've still got that email going on, mobile show with the verge.com, I believe it is. And you can drop by in our forums. You can leave a comment on this live post and you can leave a comment on the adventure post where we publish the whole video and the audio and all of the RSS, iTunes, etc. etc. If you and, see us in uh, person, you can hug us if you want. That's allowed. That's allowed. It's permitted. And we'll see you next week. 
together with uh, Dieter Bone, who on Twitter can be found at Backlone. Thanks, so, guys. Bye for the day, guys. Bye.